Hello everyone, this is Federico de la Peña. Today we will be talking about limit, limit equilibrium analysis. Alright, this presentation is from the ISRM, from the International Society of Rock Mechanics. And this is from Eric Eberhard from the University of British Columbia. And I'm just merely discussing this presentation. Now, what is limit equilibrium? It's one of the methods that you use to analyze your slopes as well as your excavations. Your other alternatives for analysis include your continuum or your finite element methods, right? Where you treat your, your problem as a mesh of a continuous material or alternatively you can also use uh, discontinuous methods like distinct like uh, discrete or dis discrete distinct element models where you treat your problem as consisting of something like lego blocks okay, where each particle behaves independently Right now, limit equilibrium uh, it it involves uh, a few methods, no? uh, including your infinite slope method and your method of slices, which we will be seeing in the, in the next few slides. Right, more on the limit equilibrium analysis. It's a widely used technique, right, wherein we talk about the balance of the force or the balance of moments okay. and this is based on statics all right so we are just analyzing a snapshot of the forces or a snapshot of the moments uh, this is in contrast with the dynamic analysis where we are actually uh, factoring in the time and the changing forces or the changing moments and it doesn't it also doesn't uh, factor in the stress uh, strain behavior okay? meaning it doesn't consider the deformation of your slope or excavation and that is actually important when you're when you start dealing with very large slopes like open pit mines or uh, problems involving large stresses like uh, deep underground excavations All right and you can see here we have an equation for the factor of safety and this is the main output of your limit equilibrium analysis you have your basically fs or factor of safety is a ratio of your resisting forces to your driving forces also be expressed as a ratio of your shear strength, right? Or the shear resistance of your material divided by the shear stress. Okay. Basically, if you get an FS of more than one, it's a stable situation. And if it's less than one, it's unstable or you are getting a failure. You can see here in the cartoon, you have your driving force. It's mostly a a downward vector that's pulling down the this part of the cliff and the resisting force is the shear strength that's uh, actually forming between this uh, failure surface okay, within the failure surface <clears throat> next right and Limit equi equilibrium analysis can be applied in two distinct stages of your engineering uh, analysis or design. One is your pre-failure analysis. Basically, if you're designing, let's say, for example, you're going to make a slope cut or you're building an embankment for a road, you will typically do some stability analysis just to make sure that 
your future construction or your future slope cut will behave uh, as intended, meaning it, it, it will not fail. Conversely, you can also use uh, the analysis as a post failure tool. Uh, examples are when you have a a slope or an embankment or a landslide. Okay, so it has undergone a failure, and you basically want to understand what happened to it. Uh, maybe for litigation purposes, like you want to sue someone, probably the uh, contractor or the agency or whoever did that uh, structure or a slope or embankment. Okay, for example, you want to sue, you want to file a lawsuit, uh, or you can, you can see uh, what what went wrong here. Okay? Or you can also use this for for academic purposes. Of course, if you want to understand better uh, the strength of the material, and as well as you want to check how it how the failure occurred, okay, you can also use uh, this as uh, for post failure analysis. Okay, uh, post failure analysis typically is typically done through your what we call a back analysis. In back analysis, what we have is we have we know um, we basically know the shape, the geometry of the failure surface, and we're just trying to reproduce it. And we're just trying, we're just playing with the uh, shear strength parameters like cohesion, friction, angle, until we reach a point of failure. Uh, basically, until we reach uh, factor safety equal to one, okay? because that's the trans that that's the transitional uh, value of factor of safety just before the failure. Right now, of course, uh, limit equilibrium it, it's a part of your modeling processes, and. Uh, as we say, it's garbage in, garbage out. And we want to make sure that the data or the inputs are not shit. <laughs> okay? We want to have the quality data. And we can obtain that. Of course, you have to consider the geological conditions. Like, are there fractures? Are there uh, discontinuities like joints, faults, beddings? that are adversely affecting the slope or okay, are there perched water tables or is there a drastic contact between the bedrock and the soil okay, and so on also the groundwater conditions of course the pore pressure distribution uh, this is really important right groundwater is really important uh, it can make or break right the stability of your slope and you typically observe your groundwater, of course. Uh, it's best to observe uh, groundwater conditions, of course, during your wet season. And you can see them either as a spring in the slope or a seepage. Or if you're working on a dry season condition, you can also check for uh, oxidation uh, colorations, basically rust colored uh, discolorations. Or you can also get um, manganese deposits, uh, the black-brown deposits that you can see due to the seepage of water. And then the next uh, inputs consist of your geotechnical parameters, your strength, uh, basically your cohesion and friction angle. You also have your deformability. Uh, this is important. Uh, this is deformability is actually more used in finite element methods. I'm uh, sorry, finite element models, FEM. Permeability, uh, yes, you will need permeability, but typically, if you have permeability data, you will first have to construct your groundwater model and then input it in your lim limit equilibrium model. All right? Also, the primary stability mechanisms, basically, 
how is the slope or the landslide failing? Right? Is it uh, a slope failure? Uh, is it a soil failure? Okay, which mostly involves rotational or circular failure surfaces. Is it a rock failure? In this case, kinematics is important. Kinematics is about what movement is permissible okay, given the constraints, the geometric constraints. Okay? For example, if you have a discontinuity or let's say a bedding plane that's dipping towards north, and of course, if it, if it is your only candidate okay, for the possible mode of failure, you can easily expect your landslide or slope to, to fail towards north. Okay? It, it can't go anywhere. It, can't, it cannot move towards west or south or east. Okay? Okay? So basically, kinematics is about the constraints. Okay? What movement or what uh, orientation of movement is permissible given the constraints like the slope phase, the discontinuities, right? Potential failure modes, of course, this is linked with the kinematics. Okay. Uh, of course, you can also consider the uh, geometry of the slope. If you have a very large, uh, steeply sloping area, this can, this can allow a large failure to occur. Or if you have a, <clears throat> a very gentle topography, but with... Uh, very weak materials, and of course, if you have a erosional air, uh, surf surfaces like river banks, okay, uh, this can, can result in a retrogressive failure, which we'll be discussing later on. Now, to gather these da this uh, data or information, as per Clayton et al. 1995, the ideal order of investigations that you have to do is as follows. You start with your desk study or fact-finding survey. Nowadays, we can easily do a Google Earth survey. You can even do a uh, street view of your study areas. If it's just be beside, if it's just a roadside uh, area, you can easily do a street view investigation. Aerial photograph, uh, this is an underrated method because you can, aerial photos actually allow you to see the site in 3D. Okay? And you can actually discern uh, certain conditions of the ground like moisture, um, dryness, uh, vegetation. But unfortunately, aerial photographs, uh, it, it's really just limited. Right? It, it's kind of hard to get uh, these data. Site walk over survey, uh, this is also important. It's always tempting when, when you reach the site, it's always tempting to focus on certain details, uh, measure, do some measurements, do some surveys, but it's not really the optimal way to do things. It's best to do to just walk over the site just to see the overall picture. Okay. And from there you can easily see what details should be you should should you be prioritizing. You can also formulate your hypothesis on what could cause the failure or what caused the failure or what problems can you encounter in the site. You also have your preliminary subsurface exploration. Uh, this could either be your preliminary boreholes or preliminary drilling if you have budget. If you don't have a lot of budget, you can also do geophysics first. Okay. If yeah, geophysics can actually be very cheap if you have the equipment. And to be honest, uh, seismic seismic equipment. So our seismographs are really useful in geotechnical investigations and they're quite they're really cheap for the value and the outputs that they can provide. Detailed subsurface exploration, of course, this will involve your detailed drilling. Although note that when you are drilling, 
Uh, particularly if you're like dealing with the landslide, uh, certain drilling methods can easily uh, destroy your data. For example, wash boring or the method of drilling where you just inject water into, drill, into the drill hole, this can easily destroy uh, the failure surface layer, like the landslide stick and sides can get washed out and so on. So <clears throat> uh, you have to be really careful with the subsurface exploration program. Physical survey, of course, your lab testing, whatever samples you get from the drilling, if you, or if you don't have drilling data, you can also take samples from uh, outcrops or from test pits. Take, uh, take uh, some testing, like obtain the unit weight, the shear strength parameters. Okay. Evaluation of data, basically you try to see which data makes sense. Okay. So you're not just blindly taking your lab testing data and just using it in the model. You have to make sure that it actually makes sense. So you can try comparing it with um, other data sets like corre correlation data, the um, correlation values of friction angle and cohesion. Just try to see if it more or less matches the lab test data. Or you can also do some back analysis of uh, similar failures and see if the friction angle and cohesion parameters are similar to what you're getting in the laboratory. Finally, you have your geotechnical design. Of course, that it depends if you're doing if you're doing limit equilibrium limit equilibrium analysis for pre-construction, you will need geotechnical design. But if you're doing a forensic investigation or your post failure investigation, uh, you won't need any design at all, right? Other stuff, uh, they're not so much relevant to the uh, uh, limit equilibrium analysis. So I'll proceed. <clears throat> now your data, of course, can vary. I mean, depending on the situation. And these are the typical uh, end, uh, spectrum of the conditions or situation that you can expect. You can either have a very complicated geology, like for example, metamorphics or sedimentary rocks where everything is mushed up because of tectonic processes. You can also have a simple geology, for example, uh, let's say a soil layer overlying a crystalline bedrock. Your site can also be inaccessible. Like for example, there's a, an active armed conflict between the rebels and the soldiers, or you can also have a site that's just near a private property and the owner might be too uh, apprehensive of you doing investigations in that area. Or the site can also be accessible, but it can be quite expensive to access. <clears throat> or you might also face a situation where you basically have no testing budget. And that's a recurring problem for research projects, like scientific projects. You're basically uh, working on shoestring budget. And you have to be really resourceful here. Okay? And you're most, most of the time, you're going to rely on correlation values and other simple testing procedures. And then in terms of data, yeah, it's either you don't have data or you have complete data. So if you, if you don't have data, uh, you're dead. And then approach of the investigation. Um, you can either go with investigating the failure mechanism. This is really common if you're doing research or doing a thesis. Or you can also be working on a predictive approach. And this is really common if you're, of course, working or you're, 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 you're a, an implementing agency or an office. You're trying to construct something. 
or you're trying to design a soap cut or a, an embankment or whatever or an open pit mine all right now we have one application of limit equilibrium this is your translational sliding translational sliding is quite generic this can apply to both soil and rock um, slopes okay for soil uh, translational sliding is quite common in your shallow landslides in shallow landslides it's this is typically consisting of just your topsoil or your regolith or your weathered, weathered bedrock that's just overlying a more competent layer like bed so like soil and then bedrock and typically these are just really thin like less than two meters uh, deep or two meters thick uh, layers that are sliding and you can use your transition sliding uh, formula in there. You can see it here. Uh, this is also applicable, of course, for rock uh, failures, particularly your planar, planar rock slides where you just have one uh, uh, discontinuity, like a bedding plane that's acting as a sliding surface or a wedge where you have a an intersection of two discontinuities and they're uh, acting as a single uh, as a translational uh, path for failure all right now you can see here a quite it's not really complex but you just have a lot of terms in this equation for the factor of safety for translational sliding I won't be discussing this whole stuff and I just want to point out what this general equation means. So this, this whole uh, equation is your factor safety. Basically the upper term is your resisting forces or your shear strength, while the lower term is your driving forces or your uh shear force now um your shear strength okay that this will consist of two main sources of strength one is your cohesion actually it's called co appa uh, apparent cohesion uh later on if, if you're doing some soil mechanics course or probably later in the in this uh of course, I'll explain why it's called an apparent cohesion. But for now, just accept this term as, as apparent cohesion. But you can imagine apparent cohesion as basically the attractive forces between your soil particles. Okay? Like the stickiness between the soil particles, that's your cohesion. And cohesion, of course, is, or cohesive strength, uh, you can, it it's a uh, it comes from two factors the co the cohesion or the apparent cohesion of your material and the surface area okay of your failure surface okay so the more surface area you have the more cohesive strength you have okay? or the more cohesive the higher cohesion you have you also get more cohesive strength the other source of shear strength is your frictional strength or your friction angle strength and you can see here a quite complicated long equation here with cosine sine sine cosine tangent basically <clears throat> i just want to point out here this tangent uh tangent phi Okay, phi is the symbol for friction angle. Of course, of course, the higher the friction angle, the more frictional strength you have. And it it's just multi. This quantity is multiplied with this huge line of quantities. All right, basically this uh, these consist. This whole quantity here is just your what we call your effective stresses. Or effective stress 
And in turn, effective stress consists of your total stress. Okay. I think this is your total. Yeah, this is your total stress. Total stress is your. It's basically the normal stresses that are acting on your on your slope. Okay. And normal stresses are actually beneficial for the stability of your slope because normal stresses are holding down. Okay? Basically, they're helping your slope bite harder okay? into the into the ground. Okay? So you actually, you're actually the more normal stresses you have, the more bite you get. So the, you're actually mobilizing more frictional. Uh, you're actually mobilizing more frictional strength this way. So that is your total or your total normal stress. And this is a function of the density and the thickness of your slope. Okay? The more, the more, the thicker your slope, your slope is and the more dense it is, you get more uh, total normal stress. Now, you, you also have another term here. You have U. And basically, this is your pore pressure. Okay, the effect of pore pressure when you have groundwater is that pore pressure uh, lifts up, lift, lift, lifts up your uh, slope mass. Okay, if for example, if you're swimming, you can imagine yourself if you're swimming, uh, you're you are, you're actually more buoyant, of course, and when you're in the swimming pool. Uh, that's your, that's basically pore pressure or water acting acting on you. Okay, your 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 effective density sort of uh, is uh, reduced. Okay, and that's how pore pressure works. Okay, pore pressure uh, basically pushes out okay, the soil grains. Okay, it 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 tries to lift up anything. Okay. So it's actually reducing the, it's actually um, acting against your total stress okay, if you have poor pressure. And overall, uh, basically, effective stress is typically calculated as your total stress minus your poor pressure. Now, in this equation, you can notice here another term. You have your V, you have your... <clears throat> You have a T term here. Uh, this T term is for the tensions in bolts or cables. This is for the, the reinforcements that you have in your slope. Okay. So basically, the effective stress in here is, is basically a summation of the total stresses minus your pore pressure plus the additional stresses that you're generating due to the uh, any mit mitigating measures that you're applying like rock bolts or uh, anchor cables okay. and overall that is multiplied by this uh, friction angle term okay. Okay, so again your shear resistance it will consist of your cohesion your cohesive strength, which is basically cohesion multiplied by surface area of the failure surface. And then your frictional strength is just your friction angle, your friction angle term multiplied by your effective stress. Right? All right, so I explained this one. Effective stress basically is just uh, total stress or the overburden stress minus your pore pressure. Okay. So effective stress is basically the net. This is your net uh, normal stress that is acting on your failure surface. All right. <clears throat> and yeah, for formalities, this is the equation for effective stress. Okay, you have your sigma phi. Uh, sigma, I think, I think this is sigma naught. Sigma naught, or your nor, or your effective stress, is equal to your total normal stress minus your u, your mu, or your pore pressure. 
And pore pressure in turn can be analyzed in different scenarios. Okay. You have a free draining tool, okay, where you basically have a re your pore pressure is actually reducing as you reach the toe, or you have a block drainage or you have uniform pressure on the side plane, okay, or you have uh, a triangular pressure on the side plane. <clears throat> but for our purposes, uh, this we won't be uh, focusing on this for now. Sensitivity analysis. This is important. Of course, this is this is useful when you are trying to know, or for example, if you have a limited budget and you're trying to know what what parameter is actually the most important one, so that you can prioritize your uh, resources. For example, you. Uh, sensitivity analysis will tell you which parameter is most sensitive, meaning which, which parameters is the most critical in controlling the factor of safety. For example, if you find out from sensitivity analysis that friction angle is the most sensitive parameter, then you can probably prioritize uh, doing laboratory tests or investigations that would give you a decent uh, uh, a decent uh, data set on your friction angle. So you're going to invest, for example, on direct shear testing. Or if you're loaded, you can probably try doing triaxial tests plus some field uh, uh, shear, like shear vein testing, of course, to make sure that you have a lot of data and you can you can basically calibrate that field data with your lab data, testing data. Now we have uh, two diagrams here. The upper diagram is showing a factor safety in the y-axis and then the water depth ratio uh, or the ratio of the water depth to the tension crack depth. Basically, uh, the x-axis is just an indicator of how much water you have in your slope. And you can see here that you have a curve, right? Of course, as you have, as you get more water depth, or you get more water in the slope, it, get, it gets more unstable. Okay? Right? So here you get one where you have a lot of water depth. Your water depth is just more is equal to the tension graph depth, so you get a really low factor safety of 0.8. And as you try to reduce the water depth, you're progressively getting a higher factor of safety. But notice the shape of the curve. Okay? And you can see that this curve is actually quite asymptotic to the x-axis, meaning you're getting diminishing returns here as you reduce the water table depth. Okay? So this means you're getting diminishing returns okay, as you try to reduce and reduce the uh, water depth here. So is water depth here a sensitive parameter? Probably not okay? because you're getting diminishing returns here okay, as you try to decrease your ratio of water depth to tension crack depth. Now, let's look at this other figure here where your y-axis is your factor safety and your x-axis is your earthquake horizontal or your peak ground acceleration or it's also called here as horizontal acceleration okay, in percent of G, of G. Of course, the higher the horizontal acceleration, the more unstable your slope gets. So you, at 0.4 g, you have a factor of safety of around 0.7. At 0 g, you get a factor of safety of almost 1.1. And notice here that you actually have a 
curve okay and more or less it, as you go here it, it the line becomes quite asymptotic to the y-axis okay so as you try to reduce the horizontal acceleration you're actually getting more or less exponential returns okay okay so as you reduce the, the horizontal acceleration your the factor of safety is rapidly rising so you can you can probably consider this parameter as a sensitive one so yeah, it's beneficial, of course, to reduce the horizontal acceleration, but, but of course, you cannot just reduce the horizontal acceleration of a slope. Uh, this this one is a function of your distance from a fault source. Okay, so so in general, you can infer here that the farther you are from a fault source, you get exponentially more stable slopes. Okay, uh, you have here bench versus versus pit wall failures. <clears throat> okay, uh, benching is, a, is actually an interesting concept because benching or the process of cutting or excavating your a slope in steps. Uh, it's interesting because the, the benching allows you to cut really, really high uh, slopes and uh, excavations like what you do in open pit mines or when you're doing road cuts in a very weak uh, material but a very really high slope okay? and the beauty with the benching is that you can control the sizes of the failures that you get that you will get okay? so depending on the design of the benches uh, you cannot completely eliminate the failures that will happen, but you can still control the sizes. So you can design the slope such that the failures will be just localized to the benches. And the nice thing about that is that it's relatively easier to clean up a bench than to clean up a whole slope failure. Rotational subsurfaces, um, this is really common when you're dealing with soil materials like your embankments or fill materials or even dams. This is also common when you're dealing with highly weathered or closely fractured rock. Okay, When you have a closely fractured rock or a very heavily fractured rock, uh, what happens to the rock is that it basically turns into a mush and if you apply stress on that uh, rock material basically this the stress is basically more uniform throughout your material and the failure surfaces will basically just develop as you apply the load on that fractured rock same same also happens with a highly weathered rock it's really not rigid it's not really a rigid body anymore it's more of a highly deformable uh, material such that as you apply your load you're basically generating a failure surface okay, okay? throughout the whole uh, rock mass or the whole uh, body of your fractured or highly weathered rock okay and generally when you do that you will be forming a subsurface and typically the subsurface will take will exploit the most uh will exploit the weakest uh shape that you could that you could take and that would be a circular shape uh in contrast if you have a slightly weathered rock or a rock with very minimal discontinuities or fractures what will happen is that you will have a very very uh, defined uh, geologic structure that will act as a weakness of your to your slope and that will form the
failure surface. So you can see here in this case, uh, this is what typically happens in a slightly weathered rock. You have a very rigid, very strong material. And the failure surface will just occur on the structure that can be ex that that can that that is kinematically allowed to fail. Okay, so you can see here this plane can actually move downward, so it, 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 you will get a planar failure in this direction. All right, uh, limit equ equilibrium. This is typically applied in rotation sliding. And this is what we will be doing in the soil soaps uh, part of our exercises. Yeah, and in applying limit equilibrium in rotation sliding, so okay, the, these are the typical the fundamental uh, concepts. Okay, so basically, the resisting forces are they're basically calculating the resisting forces versus the driving forces, and then. You may also be, you will also have to search for the least stable uh, failure surface. Okay, so you can either do that by specifying a lot of failure surfaces and then analyzing them one by one, or if your computer program can can automatically analyze all the possible uh, failures, you can that would be also more convenient. Okay. Now, the method for doing that is what we call the method of slices. And we do this because it is computationally convenient. Okay. Okay, so it, this method of slices is a, it's relatively convenient to calculate. Okay, what we do here is we just divide the slope into vertical slices. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then in each slice, we calculate uh, different forces. So you have the weight of the slice, or basically the total stress of the slice, which is due to the overburden. So the more, the thicker the material, material you have and the denser the material is, you get more. You get more weight, you get more total stress. You also have your your shear forces, which is a function of your cohesion and the friction angle and the surface area and the effective stresses. And in turn, effective stresses are calculated from the total stress minus the pore pressure plus the additional stress that you get from reinforcements. Okay, pore pressure, all right, so you know about that. E is another important stuff. Uh, this is the side forces exerted by the neighboring slices. And this is a chicken and chicken and egg problem because let's say for example you, you will try to calculate the side forces exerted on slice number six slice number six. Okay, so we have to know the side forces are that are actually acting on slide number seven, then you go up there, you have to know the forces acting on uh, slice number 10. Okay, So it is really more of a, uh, it's a, it involves a long, uh, a chain of calculations, right? Just to calculate the side forces exerted by the neighboring slices. Now, what if you are getting your slice number one is actually moving. It's gonna move forward without the influence of uh, the other slices. Okay, so that means one can also influence number two and three and so four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. So the forces here can act on other on either side. Okay, so that that gives us a big dilemma here. Okay, and the approach to that is we do an iterative calculation. So we just try to put some placeholder values on the side forces and then 
try to see if it makes sense and then we just repeat it again and again and again until we get a reasonable solution okay and fortunately the computer program takes care of that okay and yeah you can see here this 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 slide just expounds the the numerical problems that we have with the method of slices the meat here of the problem is that we have a, uh, like one two three four one two three four solution uh, for equations but we have one two three four five six seven seven unknowns right so <clears throat> So if you're, you've tried uh, solving, like for example, uh, your simple math problem where you have two unknowns, right? So you basically need at least two equations to solve that. Okay. So same here, we have like seven unknowns, but we only have like four equations to solve all those unknowns. So uh mathematically it's it's challenging to solve but of course um for uh modern programs implement a lot of uh numerical workarounds for that and i won't be talking about that because it, this is not the mathematics class okay. so i'm just gonna focus on the practical aspects of the model now there are also many ways to implement the method of slices you see a table here i won't be discussing everything but basically or you can use ordinary method for very simple calculations like uh, field calculations or excel based or spreadsheet based calculations okay so this is really nice to have if you just want to have a really quick calculation like for field charts and so on, re really simple applications, or you just want to learn about uh, limit equilibrium analysis. Okay, so for academic purposes, you can also use this. You also have Bishop's. Uh, Bishop's method is really uh, popular for circular surf surfaces. Okay, and you also have another important method here is your Janbu, Janbu's method. What's nice about here it is that it, this is applicable for any shape of slip surface. Okay. So if you're dealing with a non-rotational failure, uh, let's say for example, you're dealing with a complex landslide where the failure surface can be, may consist of a part bedding, part joint, part rotational, you can use uh, Jan Boo's method in here. Okay. Other methods here, uh, Sarma's method. Uh, this is optimal when you are dealing with uh, the seismic considerations and the stability. Okay. And Morgan Stern Price, I'm not really familiar with that to be honest. But yeah, uh, generally, ordinary method for simple calculations, Bishop for circular, Janbu for uh, any for non-circular subsurfaces. Although most modern, uh, right? So these are your uh, methods, right? And uh, yeah, I have nothing more to say. All right, Let's skip that. You see here an ordinary uh, method calculation. You can easily easily do it in a spreadsheet. So you just have to calculate the weight, the length, the angle between the base and the slice, cohesion, friction angle, for pressure, and then here you can calculate the what's in one. Uh, N1 is 
So we have a factor safety of 1.43. So N1 is the driving force, N2 is your resisting force here. Bishop, you can also, you can also do that in a spreadsheet. Right, let's do that more. Computer aided limit equilibrium analysis for most modern uh, soap stability softwares can automatically search or search for all the possible uh, failure surfaces as long as you specify it correctly. Okay, so it takes some a bit of practice and skill to properly position this uh, search box so that you can generate all the proper or the all the important subsurfaces. Okay. Uh, let's just talk about that later on. Critical subsurface search, yeah, basically, you can see here that there are so many subsurfaces generated by the program, and it's just gonna look for the least stable slip surface. Although, note that this has a pitfall, right? Uh, I've seen a lot of reports and academics what they tend to do is just look for the lowest factor of safety. Okay, so, I mean, that that makes sense, right? But, of course, there are certain situations where you can have a lot of possible failure surfaces that are less than one. Okay, so you actually can have a lot of uh, choices here. And sometimes, sometimes the program also searches for slip surfaces that are just too damn small. Okay, I've seen a lot of reports where they basically consider all the possible slip surfaces and they just find out that the least stable slip surface is this tiny weeny slip surface here okay and they say ah oh, this is the least stable slip surface this really really tiny failure surface here and we think we should design for that in our uh, project so that's fucking wrong because you should also consider the bigger failure surfaces that are that are not necessarily uh, having the lowest factor safety. So as long as you, you get a factor safety of less than one, and you should consider that, okay? You should also consider that. I mean, uh, nature, this is not, uh, limit equilibrium has a lot of numerical uh, inaccuracies, and nature doesn't always, and uh, you also get Murphy's Law. I mean, if something can go wrong, it, it's going to go wrong. So, it's not unusual, all right, to get an actual failure that will occur at, at, the, at the slice or failure surface that is not necessarily the lowest, that is not necessarily having the lowest factor safety. So basically, as long as you get a factor of safety of less than one, you should also consider that failure surface, especially if it's a large failure surface. Like for example, here, okay, the lowest factor of safety is this is the slice, but you also have a really sorry, I'm gonna annotate that. So this slice is the lowest factor of safety, but if you would look here at the bottom in these uh, slope search uh, uh, failure surface search okay so you have your multiple lines here and basically the lines that are colored orange are factor safety less than one so you can actually look at this other failure surface it's definitely bigger than this failure surface and it doesn't have the lowest factor safety, but of course, it can still fail. I mean, it has a factor of safety less than one, for Christ's sake, right? So this 
faded surface, for example, is also important. Okay, so just don't look, just you don't just look blindly for the lowest factor shaping. Just consider all the sizes that have a factor of safety of, le of less than one. Okay, that's just what I'm trying to uh, hammer here. All right. All right. So you can also do a non-circular SIP surface search, but in this case, you will have to specify it okay, explicitly in the program. Okay, again, this is useful for like your complex landslides or complex uh, so failures that may not necessarily have a circular uh, subsurfaces. Uh, you also have other advanced limit equilibrium methods like 3D methods, but to be honest, uh, 2D is really, really widely used. Most of the studies are based on 2D. So unless you're doing some cutting edge research or you have a really, really big budget, you can probably do 3D, but 2D is really sufficient for most purposes. Right, so you have here the limitations of limit equ equilibrium analysis. So it doesn't, it doesn't account for the deformation. Okay, so, so this can be problematic if you're dealing with large uh, landslides or slopes where deformation can be a factor in the stability. Also a concern if you're doing an open pit mine where you have really, really large and deep cuts where stresses are really important, also in excavations. Problems are stat statically indeter indeterminate. Okay? So the problem with having too many unknowns and too, lit too few equations. FS is assumed to be constant along the surface. Uh, this is problematic when you're dealing with complex landslides where you can uh, when when you have landslides where you can get a domino effect, okay, okay. Uh, the technical term for that are your retrogressive and progressive landslides. You can do a Google search on that. I'll discuss that probably later on the, in the course. But yeah, uh, computa computation accuracy may vary. Of course, you have seen the weaknesses of limit equilibrium. But we make do with that because limit equilibrium is really convenient and simple to calculate. Basic loading conditions, so it doesn't, again, it doesn't consider the stresses. Little insight into the slope failure mechanisms. Yeah, that's also true. If you want to really understand how a landslide or a slope is failing or probably for academic or for really specialized mitigation purposes, you're better off doing a finite element model of that slope. Uncertainty, uh, you have a lot of sources, sources of uncertainty in limit equilibrium modeling. You have your history of static and cyc cyclic loads. So basically all the loads that were imposed on the slope, all in, including the cyclic loads like earthquakes, they can affect the strength of your materials. Okay? For example, if you're dealing with clays, clays are, what happens to clays? Uh, clays are microscopic. If you look at clays in the microscope, they are composed of plate like, they look, they look like plates. They are plate like particles. And if you shear them, you try to rub them together, they will eventually, um, the plate-like particles in the clay will eventually align. Okay? They will become smoother and the frictional strength, of course, will get reduced. Okay? You get reduced frictional strength as you strain or you shear your clay. Okay? So that's what we call strain softening. Progressive failure, uh, this is when you have a, like for example, a long slope and, no, no, sorry. Let's say you have a complex uh, slope 
and you get some initial failures at the top. For example, you get a rock toppling. So you get some toppling here and the mass will just uh, land on the other parts of the, of, the, of the slope. So the toppled material, of course, it, it's heavy and it's going to impose a load on this on the lower parts of the slope. So in turn, this lower part of the slope can also move, can also fail as a result of the failures from the, from the uh, upslope areas. Okay, so that's what we call a progressive failure. We also have a retrogressive failure where the failure starts from the downslope. Okay, so the failure starts from the downslope. So this lower part fails. And the consequence of that is that the upper portions, they lose support. They also fail. And the upper portions will just uh, also just uh, fail uh, as a result of uh, loss of support. Okay. So you get a domino effect that starts from the downslope to the upslope. So that's what we call a retrogressive failure. Scale effect, this is important for rock slopes. We'll, I'm going to discuss them later in the uh, rock slope module. Rate of shear, uh, this is important for for clay materials, okay. Or in general, uh, rate of shearing or the how fast you're placing load on the slope uh, can can lead to different uh, strength conditions. For example, if you strain the clay too fast, you can get undrained conditions. Basically, undrained conditions are where you have unusually high you're basically um, aggravating the pore pressure conditions okay for a moment for a really brief moment of time okay and that that brief moment of time where you have a really heightened pore pressure uh, really heightened pore pressure that can also lead to failure uh, rate of shear, uh, this is also applicable for uh, during earthquakes. When you're shearing uh, sand materials or granular materials really fast, uh, you can get, uh, you can potentially cause liquefaction. And liquefied stoop materials are really weak. I mean, uh, it, it has happened before in dams. Okay. So if you once a granular material liquefies, you get more or less zero shear strength, and that will lead to really really weak materials that can also undergo slope failure. Okay, other stuff like aniso anisotropy or the direction dependence of your material properties. Okay. Structure shiftness, model of soil profile, of course, from the limitations of your investigation methods. Drainage assumptions, this is also important. If you don't really understand the hydrogeology of the slope, you're going to have a hard time uh, doing the model. Right, uh, sensitivity analysis, I discussed this before. Probability analysis, uh, if, you, if you've done just statistics, uh, if you, you if you've done the if you remember the Monte Carlo exercise, you're basically just starting off with a set of input parameters, and you know their mean values, or you know their average values, and you also know their standard deviation or the scatter of the data. From there, you can generate. Uh, the distribution of all the possible parameters that you can get. Okay. okay, so you basically in Monte Carlo analysis, what you do is you, you're just constantly uh, playing with the random number generator that is randomizing your input inputs, your friction angle, randomized cohesion, randomized friction angle. That's within the standard deviation. 
and the mean values. Okay. And the resulting in there's the result of those uh, of those uh, randomized values is this uh, probably probability density function. Okay. Generally, it takes shape of a normal or a bell curve. Okay. And the important feature of a normal distribution is that, let's delete that. In a normal distribution, uh, for values that are within the mean plus minus one standard deviation, okay, uh, 68% of the test of the values will fail will fall within that range okay so standard so mean value plus minus one standard deviation uh, you can capture like 68 percent of all the possible values that you can have right and there, there are more there are many other uh, ways the data can be distributed your beta distribution What's interesting here is the exponential distribution. Uh, this is applicable for earthquakes or rock bursts. Uh, rock bursts are when you have, in the underground, when you have uh, really, really high stresses, really large in situ stresses, and then you suddenly do some excavation. So what happens is the, the highly stressed rocks just undergo decompression they undergo rapid decompression and they just burst out okay, due to decompression. Log normal distributions, uh, this is mostly for more just explosive processes okay, like uh, volcanic eruption or rock avalanches. So we don't really need this much, that much. Yeah, uh, Monte Carlo sampling, okay, Monte Carlo sampling is basically we're just using a random number generator and then slap it on that uh, apply it on our statistical parameters so we can generate a synthetic data set okay for example we want to generate a synthetic data set consisting of 1000 samples so we can do that with monte carlo sampling and the beauty of that is that we can easily anticipate okay, all the possible, not, not really all, but most of the possible scenarios that you can encounter uh, just using a, a, a few uh, statistical parameters. Okay. So Monte Carlo sampling is basically maximizing your statistical data so that you can more or less anticipate a wide range of possible conditions. So you can do that, you can do Monte Carlo sampling and basically just, uh, you can do Monte Carlo sampling to generate like 1000 sets of synthetic data sets and then plug it, plug that to a, like a soap stability model and you can generate like 1000 uh, soap stability analysis results and you can easily uh, anticipate all the possible scenarios here. And from there, you can just count all the scenarios where you get a factor of safety of less than one, and then divide it by the total number of uh, models you that you did, okay? So from there, you can get a, a number called probability of failure, okay? So for example, if you have like 500 uh, results that have a factor of safety of less than one out of a total number of mod out of a total number of uh, 1000 results so that is 500 divided by 1000 you get 50 you get a probability of failure of uh, 50 percent or 0.5 so you get a 50 50 chance of failure or yeah i mean you can you can do that you can uh, make sense of that when you start applying all the uh, risk management concepts. Okay. Is a 50% chance of failure acceptable for us? That depends. Okay. Depends on your situation. Okay. 
yeah, so uh, that how that's basically the whole lecture. I mean, we have some slides here, uh, computer aided analysis. I'm gonna skip that. And uh, these are the references. I mean, I suggest reading all of them. These are all the old OG uh, authors in slope stability. Probably read half of them. Right, so uh, thanks for listening. Uh, this is the limit equilibrium lecture.